Welcome back investors. Today we're jumping into Bank of America. This was a request from one of my other viewers. I believe the username is Carrie LP videos. You can go check them out on the comments on one of my short videos. So today we're jumping into Bank of America because uh, this is an opportunity to learn a little bit more about how to analyze companies that fall within the banking industry or uh, just other financial institutions that may have similarities to banks. Bank of America, of course, is a good example of this. They've been around a long time. They've got an interesting history and they're one of the largest banks um, in the United States. So if this is something you're interested, I hope that you'll get something out of this video. If you have any uh, questions, comments, uh, corrections to anything I say, definitely drop those in the, com the comment section. Uh, just that helps me out. I really appreciate feedback. I try to get to those quickly and um, I've really appreciated the different feedback I've gotten so far on my videos. So I just wanna dive right in. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned it already, but banks tend to have you know slight differences in the types of you know headings and line item descriptions, like on their balance sheet and in their income statement. Again, this, you know, this has to do with the nature of their business. They primarily earn income on loans rather than you know when they issue a loan they're they're making money rather than you know when a typical company is you know creates a loan it's because they're needing money and you know i obviously don't want to explain the really simple stuff to you because you know the average person that's watching this clearly understands that so again diving right in their fiscal year ended 12 31 2022 it's currently june of 2023 so some of this information might seem a little dated and of course you can read through their quarterly reports the reason i choose um, to base these videos and the information i give on annual reports uh, is because the annual 10k that is submitted to the sec is fully audited um, from an external auditor whereas quarterly reports are only required to be reviewed by an internal auditing uh, committee. And so I choose to do the annual reports because I feel like um, the companies are forced in a way to be a little more transparent and to give facts and figures that are gonna be double checked and verified. Not to say the quarterly reports aren't accurate, it's just, you know, I wanna sift through some of the PR stuff and get really into the meat and you know, potatoes of a company. So they're currently trading right in that $28 range uh, today. And, you know, it's kind of gone up and down. We recently got mixed signals from the, the Fed, whether they're going to raise rates later uh, in 2023. And so that's, you know, just in the last couple of days, pushed things down a little bit. But, you know, we were just coming off a little bull rally and moving back into bearish territory. So take that price with a grain of salt looking at their price history as you can see on the uh the header column there in red uh this is uh moving from 2018 to 2022 i've added in a com compound average growth rate so that we um, factor in you know compounding in these numbers and then also i've got that fancy little spark line so you can you know visualize the trend as you can see, the price went up 2021. We got that really nice bull market where everything was way overvalued, hitting about $44. And then it's come down into the 30 and high 20s range. So if you take out $33, put in 28, it's actually closer to about 2.5% instead of 6 So like I said, everything's with a grain of salt. Hopefully things will continue to improve this year. When we're looking at the ISS governance score, all over they got a six. One is the best, 10 is the worst. Their audit um, board ratings and shareholder ratings, all really good. Uh, compensation rating is really high. You're also talking about a well over a trillion dollar in assets company, not necessarily market cap. So, I mean, they can kind of afford to pay a lot of money, but something they were docked a little bit there by the ISS governance board. We'll dig some more into profit margin and operating margin, but just for a quick glance at the current place they're sitting in the 30s, great spot. Uh, return on assets is pretty low. Um, we're going to dig into that some more. Uh, return on assets and return on equity are really big in understanding how a bank is performing and their profitability. And so this is something we're going to talk about here in just a few minutes. 
As far as their past five-year growth, their next five-year growth predictions, um, this is just by analysts, and you know we never know if this is going to be the case. Past performance doesn't dictate future performance. But per analysts, they believe that we're looking at a 20% growth over the next five years. So that's great. You know, that's definitely um, positive and maybe a return you're, you know, interested in pursuing. As far as operating cash flow, they've got, you know, it's nice and positive. Certainly could be higher. Uh, didn't get information on levered free cash flow. Uh, often that's because there's some negatives in there or due to the structure of the company. Definitely dig in some more in that and, you know, give me some information in the comments if you're, if you're interested in researching that for me. As far as price earnings ratios go, nice and low in the eights. Uh, banks typically have conservative price earnings ratio, just the nature of the business. They tend to be more conservative. If you have more of a investment based bank um, trading high in securities and focusing on, you know, really pushing the margin in terms of how they're getting their profits, you, you typically see a higher price earnings multiple. But 8.5 ish is, is a good place for banks. As far as the peg ratio, it's quite high. Um, based on the projected growth of earnings, we're paying a little too much for Bank of America at this point. But again, we don't know how it's going to grow, you know, how it will pan out. We've had some really interesting things going on in the last year with the banking industry. So certainly could, pay, you know, play out really well for Bank of America or play out really poorly. We don't know. Um, book value for banks is another really important, um, measurement. A lot of companies book values become less useful for, especially like technology companies where most of their assets are intangible assets. Um, you know, sometimes they're trademarks or software or things that, uh, are not readily convertible to cash. So a book value is not going to tell you a lot because book value kind of tells you if you had to liquidate the business tomorrow, how much cash is actually going back to the shareholders. So book value is useful for banks because their assets are probably the most clear and understandable assets of any business. Now, when you get into derivatives and securities, of course, you're going to have some, um, quite a bit of uncertainty there, but there is at least a readily available and typically liquid market for these kinds of things. So even there, you have um, a jumping off point for understanding those kinds of assets on their books. So we're trading under one, which is a great place to be at. Um, you know, less than two and a half really is good for most businesses at this point. So 0.91 is definitely good, especially with it being a bank. Price per sales, 2.41, a very conservative place there. So um, definitely not upset with that number. They pay a dividend. Um, dividends are certainly icing on the cake when you're looking at a potential stock investment. They pay only 88 cents, 87 cents. I believe their five-year average payout rate is like two bucks. So I, I didn't do a lot of research into that, but you know they are paying something it is right around 3%. So that's a good good position to be in. You're at least getting paid to hold it. A couple years ago, um, savings accounts weren't even paying out 3%. So the fact that you could put your money in Bank of America, make 3%, especially even just a couple years ago, was really good. Now you can get a high yield savings account that's gonna get you you know, four, four and a half percent. So 3% is not as attractive unless you're gonna have some appreciation in price. As far as insider ownership, 0.11%, really big company, but you know, that is kind of low. Um, I do like to see some insider ownership that signals uh, positive sentiment inside the organization, which you want to see. As far as the type of bank we're looking at, um, they are diversified or um, sometimes called a universal bank. They're not your traditional just uh, savings and loans. They're not your um, progressive investment bank. They're somewhere in the middle. Uh, and we'll dig into that here in a minute. Primary loan types would mostly be long-term and credit cards. Uh, they do home equity, you know, lines of credit. They do um, commercial, residential, everything really. So um, that to say, you know, the reason I, I point that out is when we look at their kind of average loan terms, we want to be able to see whether the long-term, short-term, 
and in turn be able to understand how sensitive they are to interest rate changes. This again wasn't as important the last probably 10 years uh, because of the really low interest rate environment we've had. But as interest rates go up with those long-term loans, uh, that can cause some disruptions for banks because um, they definitely have to hedge against that because their loans become less valuable to them than if they, again, you know, parked uh, the money in some other more conservative investment than loaning it out. So um, you definitely have to think about opportunity costs there. So moving down, um, I, I have this broken out kind of by working capital, capitalization or debt or funding structure and then profitability or earnings power. Um, some of these items maybe don't fall into those exact categories, so definitely forgive me for that. I just tried to organize it in a way where we're talking about some of the same things as we're going along. So uh, again, if you've seen my other videos, uh, you know that this is quite different in not to necessarily format, but in terms of the things we're looking at. And again, this really has to do with the nature of the business. I didn't pull up current ratio. Um, banks do typically have lower current ratios, surprisingly. They average out to like 1.3. And, you know, typical companies, we want to see a high liquidity ratio. Banks naturally kind of have that, but also they're subject to... Um, loan risk and, and those kinds of things. But something big to look at with banks, it's gonna come up in a lot of the ratios um, below here, is the net interest income. This is kind of telling you between the interest that's being paid out um, and the interest they're earning, where they're coming out at. This is kind of a, a gross profit measurement. And so Bank of America increasing it, at least conservatively, almost 2% over the last five years. Um, at least moving in the right direction. As far as just interest income alone, it is also moving about 1.68%. So that tells me that they've decreased um, some of their interest payments, um, at least a little bit more than interest income has gone up, which is always good to be able to cut your, um, cut your expenses out when you're increasing your income. As far as deposits to liabilities, this is something important because it kind of gives you a sense of how much debt is sitting there compared to, um, you know, how much readily available cash um, is in the company. Uh, deposits are one of the, the most valuable things in understanding the position of a bank financially. Um, the more deposits they can bring in, especially the more non-interest bearing deposits the better um because those are basically i mean it's almost like free money someone's just handing you money to sit in an account under your supervision now if you're paying out interest again it depends on whether you have something on the back end that justifies the interest you're paying and so really deposits to liabilities it's best to see around 80 percent here um they're sitting in the mid to high 60s and 70s uh, with a growth of 1% over five years. So really not a bad place to be in. Um, and you're probably going to hear me say that a lot. Not a bad place to be in. Um, and that's just kind of the nature of Bank of America. It, I, I believe part of it just has to do with how large it is. Um, you know, big things move slowly is the way I see it. And so, you know, a giant bank like this is probably not going to be pushing the envelope of growing revenues or margins or anything like that 10% a year. But if they can be at least moving in the right direction, that's a good sign for a large old company like Bank of America. As far as loans to assets, um, you know, we're looking around 0 0.4, 0 0.3, um, not a terrible place. That's decreasing. Um, you know, loans are a good thing to have. Um, those, again, interest income uh, comes from loans when they can loan it out. And so, you know, you want those to be highly valued. The more assets that are like intangible or goodwill sitting on the books, um, the less you have of income producing assets. And so uh, loans are a good place to be. They have decreased about 3% over the last five years. Um, you know, I, I don't like to try to predict trends, but you know, really there's a lot of uncertainty about how mortgage rates and um, consumer behavior, especially with um, uncertain housing market, uh, how that's all going to play out. So something to consider there. 
Uh, in terms of capitalization, and you know, of course, we're going to be pulling in some of the asset information into this. So it's not just debt and equity like we typically would have. But in terms of debt to equity, they are pretty high um, in the amount of debt that they have um, to run their business. Don't love to see that. It's increased by 2%. So not a great place to be to continue to have liquidity. Uh, in terms of debt to assets, um, that is decreasing about 2.5%. So, you know, not a bad place to be in there at 20%. Um, again, certainly you want more assets than debt. In terms of assets to equity, um, huge numbers there. Crazy numbers, 1,000% um, assets to equity. So a lot of the value in the business is sitting um, up higher on the balance sheet rather than lower. Um, the more assets you have in terms, terms to a ratio to equity, um, assets equal debt plus equity or liabilities plus equity, right? So the higher the assets to equity is, the greater the amount of debts um and so that that can cause some problems here again if i made miscalculations there because a thousand percent does seem crazy let me know um maybe you can look at the balance sheet and help me out with that uh tangible book value so again book value per share is really valuable with banks less so with more and more companies but still a good um, metric when you're looking at uh, banks and financial institutions They've increased it 4% over the last five years um, at a compounded rate. So definitely good sign there. And I wanted to look at tangible book value because, again, we want to take out goodwill and some of those things. I note here um, in my noteworthy section, goodwill on their balance sheet has really remained flat for the last five years. That tells me they're either not involved in a ton of you know acquisitions um, or at least that they're not way overpaying for them. Um, that they're not continually continuing to stack up um, buying for you know not good prices um, you know new ventures or other businesses or anything like that so definitely sitting at a good place there in terms of goodwill um, because it's flat uh, and that means that as you know interest income increases the tangible book value should follow that in terms of bad loan percentage and the coverage for that, that's something you want to calculate with banks because, again, your loans are your income source. So um, one of the big risks for banks is, you know, if people stop paying their loans, you stop making money. And so banks really need to be conservative in ensuring that they have some kind of coverage or a provision for loan losses on their balance sheet and that they've got enough there to um, take care of them if things kind of drop off. So kind of like, um, you know, if you've seen headlines recently, more and more Americans going into debt, more and more people at risk of default. You have student loan payments um, starting back up in, uh, I believe they start to be officially due in October or late September. So um, that's going to, you know, kind of crunch on, uh, people's wallets. So those kind of things might be indicators of potential defaults on more and more loans. So a company like Bank of America or other banks need to make sure that they have adequate provisions to cover those losses. So um, they manage to keep you know their bad loan percentage at about 1% um, of what they have coverage for. So you know not a bad place to be at in terms of that I, i'd like to see you know a higher um coverage ratio for that but um it it has increased a little bit in terms of uh, percent of their deposits being interest bearing um that's gone down and so again that's kind of a good thing to see that more and more of their deposits are non-interest bearing deposits that means they're paying out less for the money that's um essentially being handed over to them. Um, so that's kind of capitalization, looking at the structure of, you know, how the business is funded. I think they do okay here. Um, I think they have much better prospects in terms of working capital and, the you know, somewhat towards the profitability of running the business. Capitalization, I'm not terribly impressed with this, but, um, you know, not, not terribly surprised either. 
in terms of profitability, and, and I use the term earnings power um, for banks, um, this is going to dig into things like efficiency ratio and their return on equity and assets. These um, can be valuable for other businesses. Of course, you have to compare within an industry and not across industries, or else you know you might think a business is performing really poorly, but in reality, compared to its competitors, it's doing really well. Um, but banks especially... Um, with uh, their return on assets. Again, their assets are more defined. So these kinds of ratios are useful and then efficiency ratio as well. Um, looking at how efficiently they can generate their income. Uh, this is also, you know, just important metrics. So as ter in terms of earnings per share, they've been able to steadily increase those 4% uh, across five years. Their net interest margin has gone down um, about a quarter of a percent over the last five years, but re actually remaining fairly flat. You take out, you know, 2021 where you have, you know, major shakeup in financial markets um, with the high increases in, you know, people moving into more speculative um, investments rather than parking it in the bank. Uh, and then kind of going back up here in 2022 with, um, with people parking more money at the bank. In terms of return on equity, um, there's not a value in 2018. And the reason is because, you know, I pull five years worth of data from Seeking Alpha. Uh, that's free if you just sign up for a subscription where you get an email and uh, they'll provide 10 years, but you got to pay for that. Um, someone asked me if I had uh, Webull and uh, I don't. I do have like a Fidelity screeners and, and those kinds of things. Uh, so I have some services that others would have to pay for. But generally speaking, when I'm doing analysis of companies, I want to be able to use what's freely available. Um, even some of these services that, you know, you have paid options like Zax.com. Um, you, if you directly search a specific company, you can usually get to their page and see some of their ratings uh, without having to, um, you know, jump through a, a paywall. Uh, in terms of return on equity and return on assets, uh, increase their return on equity, which is um, definitely positive. Um, being more efficient with the uh, use of equity in the business, but the return on assets is decreased by six percent or six and a quarter percent. Uh, over the last um, four years, because again, we're taking average beginning of the period to end of the period. And moving into efficiency ratio, ideally you have less than 50 um, for your efficiency ratio, and they do well here. Um, they've decreased it. Um, a lower number is better, um, kind of like golf here. And uh, so doing all right there. Um, not spectacular, not amazing, but um, all right, which I guess, you know, throughout this video, maybe that's what you take away um, when you're looking at Bank of America. Not spectacular, not amazing, but good. Um, so going into my noteworthy section, this section is mostly from me reading through the actual 10K filing. Uh, something I, I wanted to mention was if you look at their annual report, they post under investor relations on their website. Almost every section that you would normally see is left blank. Uh, because they have permission through the SEC in their annual report to not show a lot of things. So, uh, you know, their annual report's nice and short and sweet, but they do have to report all those things in their 10K when they file to the SEC. So you can go find that in sec.gov um, under their Edgar um, Library of Corporate Filings. It's all free. Uh, it's all publicly available. Um, so like if you went on Yahoo Finance and you wanted to look at their little balance sheet um, summary, it's super non-descriptive. You know, you don't have drop downs, you don't have breakouts, you have assets, uh, you have liabilities, you have equity, you have the bottom line. Like you don't get a lot on those statements. But if you go to their actual filings, you can see a lot more in-depth numbers and uh, information um, in the actual filing they give to the SEC. So some of the noteworthy things, if you haven't already kind of scanned through, uh, the number of loans they have um, jumped 7% from 2021 to 2022. That's good. That's a sign of positive business. Um, pulling in more people that are going to be paying these um, higher interest rates as that's going up. 
um, the amount of mortgage backed securities on their in their assets has decreased substantially year over year for the last five years. It's continued to decrease. Part of that may be amortization, but a big part of that seems like they're divesting out of that. So that's a good thing. Of course, if you think about 2008, you know, the 2007 and the, you know, whole great recession and all of that with the crash of the housing market, mortgage backed securities definitely send a shiver down your spine. But, you know, there's been a lot of regulation on that, those, um, ensuring that um, those trenches where they were sticking in all of that subprime stuff, but making it look nice to the credit. Um, credit rating agencies um hopefully a lot of that stopped but even if it hasn't they're at least divesting out of it um they have been shifting it more into investment securities and trading asset securities so they've decreased mortgage backed but they've moved into investment and then trading asset securities so i think that's a positive thing for them to be doing again it lessens the sensitivity to these long-term higher interest rates um, and, and speaking of that, higher interest rates um, decrease the value of their long-term loans, like their mortgages, which they have quite a few. Um, kind of looking back up, I'll scroll so you can see it. You know, we're talking about return on assets. Um, the average for banks from 2022 to 2023 uh, has been 1.08 to 1.36. So definitely pretty low there. Uh, bankregdata.com um, is kind of a useful visual visualization tool. It's got a lot of comparison tools um, where you can see lots of information. It gave Bank of America 1.37 currently uh, for the last quarter. So they may be calculating it a little differently than I calculated it. So definitely, you know, go check that out. Uh, there is a site, if you look to the square to the right, FFIEC, they have all the banking information you could ever want or need that's the federal financial institutions examination council um, you can do custom report generation uh, quarterly they take all of the bank's data and information and they publicly publish all of it they generate all of the ratios for you and you can compare them side by side with fancy graphs and all sorts of stuff um, it takes it's kind of an older looking site so it takes a little getting used to navigating it but you know if you can figure it out you can definitely get a lot of meaningful data there that's all free bankreg.com um bankregdata.com they charge you so um definitely default because bankregdata.com pulls their data from ffiec so i mean really you can just cut out the middleman there uh bank efficiency ratio again we i mentioned that the way i calculated it was non-interest income divided by net interest income plus non-interest income minus the provision for credit losses. Again, you want less than 50. Um, and that's going to tell you how efficiently they're bringing in money and covering um, their backside from you know bad loans. Um, something noted in the annual report is that insufficient fund and overdraft policies. Um, I know that the current administration is really pushed on getting rid of what they call junk fees. Um, and some of these things that surprise consumers in their banking accounts, um, like overdraft fees. So because of those policies, um, Bank of America saw a decrease in the, their fee income by $1.1 billion. Um, I believe that was last year. So that's kind of a challenging thing. You know, we, we see these good things for the consumer, but it can hurt the businesses maybe that you're invested in. So um, obviously double-edged sword there. Uh, as far as net interest margin, uh, that's your loans or securities minus the interest paid divided by value of loans or securities. The higher that number, the better. So we've seen a decrease a little bit. Maybe I spoke wrong when I f was first looking at it. Um, so not, not a great thing. Um, hopefully they can increase that margin moving forward. Um, I didn't include securities. I just looked at loans. Um, so if you wanted to recalculate that yourself, um, that's definitely an option. Um, you know, there's been some news headlines. I haven't had a chance to really dig into them because I spent a lot of time reading 185 pages of the 10K, but um, there is some speculation that Bank of America can really benefit from the failure of these other large banks. Um, you know, we can't really talk about the banking industry without talking about SVB and um, First Republic and some of these other banks that have toppled over. 
Um, these are huge banks, um, massive, massive banks. And a big part of it has to do with um, inadequate efficiency, inadequate net interest margins, um, over leveraging in, um, you know, maybe long term loan rates, but not accurately, adequately hedging um, for these higher interest rates. I know that was a big problem for SVB is they just totally disregarded the way that um, bond maturities were going to affect them. Um, they also have, you know, had a lot of, um, oh, venture investment capital um, tied up in their deposits. And so that caused a really big issue as, um, it, you know, venture capital started to dry, dry up a little bit um, and that affected the bank's bottom line. So a big part of why it's important to understand the nature of a given bank when you're analyzing it, where their income comes from, um, and how they've structured um, ensuring that they're safe um, from some of these larger risks like interest rates. There's a couple critical audit matters that came up um, that the auditors PricewaterCooper noted. So the first one was their allowance for loan and lease losses, commercial and consumer card loans. Uh, so the reason they brought up this and then the next note just had to do with the amount of management discretion that goes into these calculations. Obviously, loan and lease losses, their allowance for that, that they accrue is really important um, because that ensures that they're demonstrating to investors that they're safe come, you know, a rainy day. And so, um, you know, definitely something to look at there. And then their other critical audit matter, again, dealing with uh, discretion of management's estimates and um, valuations is the valuation of certain level three financial instruments. Level three financial instruments, which is defined really in really lengthy sections in the 10K are kind of undeterminable valued items, um, uh, you know, that they have to place a value to, that they trade um, as essentially derivatives. And so those are kind of challenging. And so the auditors noted that, well, you know, there's a lot of leeway in how you're valuing these. So something to take with a grain of salt. Um, there was a credit loss note um, in the notes section. And again, you got to realize on a 10K, there's 185 pages and probably 100 of those was just the notes to the financial statements. So you can look at the financial statements, but it's hard to understand what's going on if you don't read through all of the notes. Um, and so one of the things they point out is they had a $3.3 billion or a 30% increase in their allowance for credit losses recorded in January 1st of 2020. So they, they really beefed it up back in 2020. They've continued to contribute to that. So a note like that kind of tells you, okay, they are moving in the right direction. They've really, you know, tried to poise themselves for possible challenges. January 1st, 2020, COVID had, hadn't quite totally hit. It was starting up in China back in November 2019. And then that it really kind of kicked off, uh, if you want to call it that, in March of 2020. So right at the right time, it seems like they really beefed up their um, allowance. And I, I lost you for a second. But um, looking here, um, they have, interestingly, if you're looking through their um, notes um, they point out they have 18 trillion dollars in interest rate swaps so something to consider there those are apologies those are a type of derivative um, you know definitely do some research on those they're they're not I don't believe as risky as say mortgage-backed securities so not not to be terribly concerned about but that is one of the highest um, accounted for types of derivatives or you know odd and insecurities that they hold are these interest rate swaps um and a trillion you know 18 trillion it's unfathomable how large that is um something that i noted really positively on the loan to values on their residential mortgages um and their um line of credits um you know home equity loans um, they were all, well, actually this wasn't positive. It was mostly at or below 90%. So not really a good sign. Um, you definitely want a higher, uh, a lower loan to value ratio. Cause that means that they're putting up more collateral. 
but the majority of the mortgages and home equity um, loans all had credit ratings of 740. Um, huge split there. So um, definitely a positive there. Um, probably the high, you know, high loan to value ratios has to probably do with um, FHA loans and those kinds of things. Um, $10.6 billion um, of their uh, time deposits are uninsured. I couldn't find good values on insured deposits versus uninsured deposits. So if you can find something in the 10K, definitely let me know in the comments. Um, again, I noted that their goodwill's flat, so good that they're not um, adding in overpriced acquisitions. Um, again, bankruptcies, you know, these big, large banks and other businesses might be good opportunities for Bank of America um, because it's in a pretty stable position. And again, um, as these other banks fall, um, this whole banking crisis, hopefully it's over, but the bank crisis sent about $15 billion in deposits to Bank of America. So, you know, bad news for someone is, is good news for someone else. Um, I kind of started digging into their competitors, but it's, you know, it's really obvious. JP Morgan's probably the largest bank out there. You got Wells Fargo, um, and then some of these other, um, foreign banks, HSBC, Royal Bank, Commonwealth, um, HDFC, um, and then again, JP Morgan. So that's what all I've got for you, um, today. Um, as you can see, I've, I've done quite a few of these analyses and, uh, you know, I'm just going to click here. You can kind of see how how far they've come, you know, from just basic one one line item to, you know, stretching it out over um, five years and getting those compounded uh, average growth rates. So if there's something you want to see in future videos, I'm constantly updating how I'm doing things. And uh, I've said it probably eight times, but I, I want feedback. I want to get better at this. So um, definitely drop that in there. As always, like, comment, subscribe. And, uh, you know, I'll see you next time. You know, dig in, invest well, and, you know, hopefully you're successful out there. I'm, I'm definitely trying to be over here.